Okay? Is this pretty straightforward? We talked about maximums and minimums. Yes. Uh -huh. I probably use this. I probably use this exact file to show it in college algebra. Yep. How about this one? It's closed. Continuous function. Closed interval. How about a global max? Yes. Yes. Hmm. But. Uh, The global maximum, the maximum is the highest point, right? The, the value of the highest point is 225, but it happens at two different places. So if someone asks you, what's the global maximum, you would say 225. But it could happen in two different places. So you can have a global maximum occur in two different places. The maximum is the actual maximum value, the y coordinate. How about global minimum? There's two of them, I already gave them to you, right? There's two of them there. And then how about locals? You have three. Two local mins and one local max. Yeah, just give you a bunch of those. All right. If a function, this is a theorem, right? Theorems are very important, all right? If f is a continuous function on a closed interval, that means I can draw without picking my pencil and it's on a closed interval, then f attains both an absolute maximum value and an absolute minimum value in the interval. This theorem says very plainly this is what this is saying. If I have a function that starts somewhere and ends somewhere else, and I have to draw it without picking up my pencil, I'm going to have to have a highest point and a lowest point. It has to happen. So there's no way I can connect these without having a highest point and a lowest point. Do you all agree? I can't do it. I mean, I can't not have it happen. So I can do that, and then I just created a, a what? An absolute maximum. What about minimum? What's the absolute minimum? The left end point. You see? And we could all take turns coming up here and playing connect the dots here. And no matter who does it, as long as you draw it without picking up your pencil, you're going to have to have an absolute max and an absolute min. Do you all agree? Um, that's exactly what I was going to do. Very good. So what about this? Horizontal line. Your highest is your lowest. The global maximum and the global minimum are the same value. It's constant. So whatever this y value is, let's say that this was like two units up. The y value is two there. Your global maximum would be two. Your global minimum would also be two. And how many different places does it happen? At every point, right? Every point generates the local maximum and the local minimum. So that's a good question. All right, this next illustration, I was doing this yesterday, I actually had to go in there and edit the code. We were doing this and these are, those ex these are just examples, like if I draw a straight line, I'm obviously going to have a global max and a global min. If I draw any other sort of curve, I'm going to have what, global min, global max. And then this one right here, let me take these off. What about this one? The dotted line is a, is a vertical asymptote. Does this have a global maximum? This goes like this and turns up and goes up forever. Does it have a global maximum? No. Does it have a global minimum? Yes, down here, right? This point. But it has no global maximum. I thought I was supposed to guarantee to always have one. It's not continuous. This is not continuous. You see, in order for me to try and get around the absolute max min thing, I had to pick up my pencil. That's the only way I could do it. So this, this function right here 
would not qualify for the theorem. It has to be continuous on a closed interval for it to happen. All right, this next theorem states, this is Fermat's theorem, if f, if you have a function, if it has a local maximum or minimum at some point c, and the derivative exists, then the derivative is zero. Pay attention to what's being said here. Let's say you have a function, and it has a local max or a local min. That means it has a little highest point or a little lowest point. If the derivative exists, then the derivative must be zero. If the derivative exists, the derivative must be zero. So let me draw. This is a local max, right? What is the slope of the tangent line there? Slope of the tangent line is zero. And the derivative, right, is the slope of the tangent line. So all this theorem is saying is everywhere that you have a, a local max or a local min, the derivative is zero. No, wait a minute, hold on. Is that, what is it? I just said that, I just said that everywhere you have a max and min, the, the derivative is zero. That's not what this says. If I, it says if I have a local max or a local minimum, is it saying that the derivative is zero? No, at that point zero. Is that what that says? You sure that's what it says? Yeah. If you have a function that has a local maximum and minimum at some point, then it's guaranteed that you're going to have a derivative of zero there. What am I missing here? The derivative has to exist. So, five points bonus to someone who can come up here and draw me a function that does not qualify for this theorem. You want it? <laughs> okay, you don't have to do it on camera. You can do it over here. Now, if you get it wrong, it's five points off. Oh, I, I can lose five points. Oh, ah, perfect. Five. Excellent. Can I have those there we go. All right, so this function, it can do whatever. All right, let's, let's let this do whatever. It doesn't matter. Does this have a local maximum? I'll put it on here since I want that on camera. Does that have a local maximum? Yes, this is the highest point on the graph, right? That is the highest point on the graph. If you read this theorem to say that, hey, if you have a local maximum or minimum, the derivative must be zero, then that's an example of something that doesn't do that, right? What's the derivative at this point right here? It's undefined. It doesn't exist. Remember, derivatives don't exist at corners, cusps, discontinuities, or vertical asymptotes. This was back, 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 okay? So this perfect example of a function that has a local maximum but the derivative is not zero there. But the problem is this theorem says, look, if the derivative exists, so if the derivative exists, then it must be zero. It's possible that the derivative would not exist. And if the derivative does not exist, you throw the theorem out the window. Is it possible, I'll offer another five points to someone else, can't be you. Is it possible to draw a function where the derivative does not exist it's, and it's not a local max or a min, but it's continuous? So I want a continuous function that has a derivative that does not exist, but continuous, derivative doesn't exist. There's one other thing. Oh, and it's not a local max or a min. Can anyone do it? Draw me something that you can't pick up your pencil and the derivative doesn't exist at a certain point and um, it's not a max or min there. You sure? I think. It's, okay, so the Try. derivative does not exist. Derivative does not exist at some point. It's continuous, but it, it can't be a, at a local max or min where, where this thing happens. Okay. You're, that's, a that's, a that's not a function, though. Why not? Because <laughs> it fails the vertical line test. Okay? There, now it's a function. 
Okay, yes, I agree with that. Um, what do y'all think? Yeah, there's a local max. Where? I, I think this would qualify as a local, this would qualify as a local um, minimum because it's the lowest point next to it. That's a good try. You're, you're, you're close, but look, if you're gonna do this, I think, were you trying to avoid the min or max here by making it flat? Is that, yes? No, that, or were you just trying to create the, the does, not does not exist? Okay, because this, this right here, this right here, the, this would be a local minimum. And I said it can't be a minimum or a max. But the derivative wouldn't exist there. You drew this, but that's still gonna be considered to be a local minimum. And the reason why is because this, I said it's the lowest point in the little neighborhood. If we actually go back and look at the definition, this is why I asked you to go back and look at it. It can be, to be uh, local, it can be less than or equal to. In other words, when you look around next to it, left or right of it, you want it to be below or equal to the things next to it. So here you would be equal to everything next to it, right? And on this side you would be below it. So this would, be a, a, this would still be a local minimum. But I hadn't shown you that, so that's, that's a good uh, shot at it. Anyone else want to try? No? Last call? You can go for it? Okay, you can do it over there. Okay. Well, where's where's the point that you're saying the derivative doesn't exist? At the as, at the asymptote. Yeah. Well, the function doesn't even exist there. Your function needs to exist there. So you would be you wouldn't be continuous there. This is I see what you're trying to do. You're trying to you're trying to make it where you're saying the derivative doesn't exist at this vertical line. And my argument would be, well, your function doesn't even exist there, so I can't even look here. We have to be able to find a point C to plug in. That's a good try. You want to go for it? Yeah. Last, this is the last shot. You can do it right there. <laughs> is that that saw blade function? That, those are a bunch of max and mins, though. Right? Yeah, but the derivative doesn't exist. Only, the derivative only doesn't exist at these tops and bottoms. Mm -hmm. Remember, I'm looking for a continuous function. At some point, the derivative doesn't exist, right? But at that point, it's not a local max or min. It's a good try. All right, so let me show it to you. Right there. I draw it without picking up my pencil. It's a function. Uh, it has. It's never horizontal. Okay, for this, it looks horizontal because I'm trying to illustrate the fact. Look, there's a there's a function that does this. It's called arctan. Arctan. Did we graph arctan in here? I think we did. Maybe we didn't. You can, you can go back to pre-cal and look up Arctan's graph. <laughs> Are, were you just being agreeable? No? Did we graph it? I thought we graphed all of them. Okay. Look, if you take tangent, did we talk about inverse functions or reflections? Yeah. That if you take the identity and you reflect it over, that's what the inverse looks like? So if you take tangent, this is tangent, and you, and you flip it over, it's going to go like this instead. Ah, oh, I missed it. And it'll actually have horizontal boundaries. But this is it right here. And what happens is as you're moving towards that point in the middle, look at your tangent line. What's the slope? Positive, 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 positive. Steeper lines do what? Bigger slopes? And it's trying to become 
almost vertical, right? And so when you, get, when you get right to that point, just at that instant, just at that instant, you're vertical for just a second, just at that instant. As soon as you go past it, it tilts slightly. You see it? So at that point, your vertical tangent, your undefined derivative. But this is continuous, but that's not a local max. Here's what I'm trying to get at, is that if I tell you that you have a function where the derivative is zero, does that mean you're at a maximum or a minimum? No. If I tell you you have a function where the derivative is, um, doesn't exist, does that mean that you're at a maximum or minimum? No. What the theorem says is that if, if you have a local maximum or minimum, if you do, and the derivative exists, then it must be zero. It would be impossible to draw a function where the derivative existed and the derivative wouldn't be zero if you're looking at a maximum or minimum. There's no way to do it. I know this seems a little confusing, but uh, it'll, it'll all clear out here, I hope. All right, so in order to tackle this problem, the, remember the eventual thing we want to be able to do here is I give you a function on a closed interval and I want you to find the highest and lowest points, right? That's what I want. The, there are two things though that we need in order to do this. In order to find the highest and lowest points, all right, in order to find the highest and lowest points on a continuous function on a closed interval, there's two things that we will have to look at that are, how do I say this? critical <laughs> right they are critical for us to be able to find the highest and lowest points and we call them critical numbers and they quite simply are everywhere that you could ever possibly get your derivative to be zero because we know when we see a derivative of zero we know we have flat tangent lines right the thing that we don't know is whether or not that's a max or min so right there we would have flat tangent line hey that's a max right Hey, here we have a min, right? Here, oh, that, sorry, that's not what I wanted. Here, what's the slope of the tangent line right there at that point? Well, what's the slope of the tangent line here? Zero. Here, zero. Here, zero. So just because you have zero doesn't mean you're at a max or min. But when we are at a max or min, it being zero, is, it happens, right? Here's some other things. We could have a max like that. We could have a max like that, right? Derivative doesn't exist. Derivative doesn't exist. But we could also have this, the one we just talked about. Derivative doesn't exist. This is not a local max or a local min, right? But when they do happen, right? When they do happen, it's either a derivative is zero or a derivative doesn't exist, right? When they do happen. And that's why we call these critical numbers. Anywhere that our derivative is zero and anywhere our derivative doesn't exist is, is referred to as a critical number. Yes? So the one on the tangent, the arc? Yes. Oh, it's, it's the arc tangent one. Those would still be considered critical numbers? Yes. Yep. A critical number is, uh, the critical number of, of a function is any number that causes the derivative to either be zero or causes the derivative to not exist. Those are critical numbers. Now what we do with that information, we have still yet to see. But we will need that information to do anything. And this step right, this last piece right here is the last note in the section and it's the most important one. This will creep its head out again in different math classes. Anyone who gets through Cal 1 should know, how, should know the closed interval method for finding the absolute maximums and minimums of a function on a closed interval. There are a set of steps. It's a procedure. What we're going to do is if someone gives us a function on a closed interval, we're first going to go and find the critical numbers. Once we find the critical numbers, all we're going to do with those numbers is plug them into the original function. 
And then we're going to take the endpoints of the interval and plug those into the function. And we're going to look at those answers, we're going to compare them. And that's it. That's how we find the highest and lowest values. But I'd like to try and get us to understand why this will work. Let me try and, try and help you understand it. I'll go through those steps. Don't worry, we're going to work through plenty of problems to get you used to that. All right, so let's say I have a continuous function. It goes from here to here, all right? And I'm going to draw an x and y axes in here just to get us going. Let's just call this point A. Let's call this point B. What if there's some point in here, I'll call it C, and I tell you at that, at that value C, the derivative is 0. Okay? That would be a critical number, wouldn't it? Because it's where the derivative is 0. I could have this scenario right here. I could have this. Maybe I plug that in. Maybe the graph does something like that. Would that satisfy this? Yes? And then maybe there's another point in here, I'll call it D, where the derivative uh, doesn't exist. I could, do, I could do that vertical tangent thing. You want me to do that? And then I'll bring this back up. So there's where that was, right? Do you all see that? Now, I also have another point in here. Right there, wouldn't that be another point? E, right there, where the derivative would be 0? That's one way I could have drawn this, right? I know for sure I'm going to have an absolute max and an absolute min, guaranteed. Because there's no way to draw it without that happening. It's continuous. But why is it that when I look at a function without its graph, that all I have to do is figure out where these happen, and then plug that point into the original function, that point into the original function, that point into the original function, and then the two endpoints into the original function, and compare their values. Why is that all I need? I need a different color. I don't have a different color in here. Okay, oh well. What would be, a, what would be another scenario here? If I had derivative of zero, what's another way I could have drawn this? I could have come, I could have come down with it, right? Maybe done that. And then I could have been clever and dropped back down. That derivative is zero there, right? Comes down, flattens out, and then goes back. I could make the, the D not exist. I could do a corner there, couldn't I? Like that. Close enough? And then how about an E? I need it to be what? Zero? So how about I, how about I flatten it out like that and then go back up like this? I'm sorry? I see an elephant. You don't see an elephant? Okay, whatever. At point D, I could have done what? You could not have come like infinity, like it went to infinity or something. Because it wouldn't be continuous, yeah. Look, the main point of this is, is this. And I, maybe I didn't put the note up long enough for you to see it. You're going to have to read on, on top of this. To, to find the absolute max and mins of a function on a closed interval, you have to find the critical numbers. That means tell me where the derivative is 0 and where it doesn't exist. Find, those, find where that happens. Then evaluate the function at the endpoints of the interval and, oh, and evaluate the function. So evaluate the function at the critical numbers, then evaluate at the endpoints, compare the answers. The largest number is your absolute max, lo lowest number is your absolute min. What's your question? Yeah. Why? Uh, I was going to say because it's just a distance from the x-axis, isn't it? Like, it doesn't matter how you draw this. Yeah, it does not matter how I draw this. If I have to meet these conditions, it does not matter how I draw it. At one of these points, I'm going to be at the highest or lowest points. Is there any, can, can you think of any way I could draw this? If these are my only conditions, is there any way to draw this from here to here 
where the max or min will not happen, glo global max or min, will not happen at one of those points. Let's, let's, try and, let's try and put, let's try and get a point that's higher than this one. If I draw something that would go higher than that, then I would have to go up higher, right? So maybe, maybe you say I go like that and back down. What's wrong with that? The derivative is zero there, right? It has to be zero here. So you couldn't do that, right? So how could you do it? Maybe I do this. Now the derivative there is zero, so that's, that's good, right? That matches. Now I need the derivative not to exist here. So what do you want me to do? Maybe do, do a vertical there again? And then here it has to be zero, so I come back down and go back up. OK, so there. That one will work. But yeah, so, but do you see that the global max change places? Yeah. But it's still happening at one of those points. And that's what this theorem is all about, this method is all about. It's about, look, at the end of the day, continuous function on closed interval. Your absolute max and min are going to happen either at the end points or at the critical numbers. It's got to be at one of those. So all we're going to do, figure out what those are, plug them into the function, compare the values, the biggest value we have is the biggest, the smallest we have is the smallest. I have enough time to do one very basic example. Let's take, uh, let's take a function that's very simple. Let's take f of x is x cubed minus 4x squared plus 1. Now I picked that function on purpose because in a college algebra class, if you were asked to graph this, you could maybe graph it. Maybe. <clears throat> but you would not be able to tell me what the highest and lowest point is. Not in college algebra class. Now I need to give you a, cl a closed interval. So let's go between negative 1 and 3. I'm just making that up. So if I graph this, and I only graph it between negative 1 and 3. I should have this like roller coaster looking thing, right? What's the, what's the biggest value it ever gets to? What's the smallest value it ever gets to? Right? So we have to check first. Do we have a continuous function on closed interval? Yes. So we can use the closed interval method. First thing I'll do, find the critical numbers. What are the critical numbers again? Anywhere where find where the derivative is zero and find where the derivative does not exist. D N E. Right? That's what it means for us to find the critical numbers. Set the derivative equal to zero, and then tell me also when the derivative is undefined. In, in both of those cases, don't you need the derivative? So the first step is just take the derivative. What is the derivative of this function? 3x squared minus 8x. So you have to get the derivative. Right? If you, get, you can't get the derivative, it's over. All right, first thing, uh, or let's do this one here. I'm going to take the derivative, I'm going to set it equal to zero. I'm going to do my work right here underneath this. So I found the derivative, now I'm setting it equal to zero. <coughs> what type of equation is this? Quadratic. And so you have different methods to solve this. Fortunately for us, you do not need the quadratic formula here. You can just do a factor out of G, uh, an x, right? The GCF. Greatest common factor is x. Pull it out. 3x minus 8. <coughs> Set each factor equal to 0. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Set each factor equal to 0. x is 0 and 3x minus 8 is 0. So what are our two solutions? 0 and 8 thirds. Eight 
Now it's important right now that when we look at these critical numbers that we make sure that they live in our interval. Does zero live in there? Yes. yes. Does eight thirds live in there? Yes. yes, it does. It's smaller than three. So both of these live in here. What if one of these did not live in there? You just ignore it, okay? Like if zero didn't live there, I would just cancel it out and completely ignore it. But it does, so I'm just gonna leave it here. All right, are we done? No, I need to figure out where the derivative doesn't exist. I'll do that up here. Where does the derivative not exist? And this is a question I'm asking myself. Does the derivative ever not exist? Look at the derivative. Do you see any problems with any x values you would ever plug in here? Between, Between negative 1 and 3. No, right? In fact, for any number, right? This is a polynomial. Are you ever going to get division by zero? You ever going to get a square root of a negative number? No, polynomials behave very well, don't they? So we're not going to have any issues. So this doesn't happen. Now, you can imagine with some of the derivatives we have taken in this class, that as these functions get more complicated, this is going to be important because we're going to have fractions. We're going to have to figure out, hey, maybe we can get division by zero. We have to take that into account. But this is our first example, very simple polynomial. The derivative is a polynomial, not a problem. Nope, all right? You can put whatever you do, it doesn't apply. Uh, you could say the derivative is a polynomial, therefore it's nice or whatever, continuous. All right, so now I'm ready to wrap this up by figuring out what the highest and lowest value is. And to do this, all I have to do is take these two numbers, plug them into the original function, and the endpoints, and plug them into the original function. So I'm going to be plugging in a total of how many? Four different points. Does not matter what order you do. You could say, hey, I want to start with the endpoints, and then after that, I'll do the uh, critical numbers. And you might need a calculator. You may not. Let's see. Negative 1 goes in here. Negative 1 cubed. Negative 1. Negative 1 squared. 1. Negative 4 times 1. So minus 4 plus 1. What do we get there? Negative 4. Okay. If we plug in negative 1, we get negative 4. That could be the lowest point. Could be the highest point. I don't know yet. I have to compare it to all these. I'll do the 0. The 0 is easy. 1. Okay, so that's definitely not the highest point, right? Negative four is not the highest, because one's bigger than that. So this could be the highest now. Uh, three goes in here, 27 <coughs> minus, three squared is nine, minus 36 plus one, so negative eight? Negative eight. Oh, that's now our lowest point, right? And now we have to plug in 8 thirds. <sighs> so it's okay if we get a decimal here. That's okay. We can do this on our calculator if need be. Now I made up this problem so I don't have the result, but let's see. 8 thirds is what? 2.66666? Who's going to do that for me? Yeah, I only have my phone. Do you want the decimal? Or yes, I want the decimal. It's 2.6. The whole thing? Yeah. 2.66? Positive? Yeah. I get that the whole equation. I'm trusting your answer, but I'm about to check it. So, All right, so what would be our global maximum? Global maximum. 2.666, right? This would be, I'm going to put GM for global maximum, right? Uh, no. Glo oh, oh, sorry. Oh, that was just 8 there. Oh, no, no, I'm sorry. I meant the whole thing. That seemed weird. Anyone else get it? 8.48? Negative 8.48. Anyone else get that? About? Yes? Okay, well, that changed the story, didn't it? 
that's actually our global minimum. Okay, that's the lowest point. So this right here is our global minimum. I'll put global minimum. I'll put global min, okay? What's our global max? One. Now, whenever you, whenever you just have like one place where this happens, right? Zero, you plug in zero, you get one. Plug in eight thirds, you get this. When you just have like one place where it happens, I like to write it as a point also. So like I actually like to write global max zero one. And then a global minimum, I like to write eight thirds negative eight point four eight. Something like that. And I only do that because not only does this tell you what the value is, right? It tells you where it happens. And that becomes important later to know where it happens. Understand this? No, because we're looking for globals, oh. right? The closed interval method gives you global maximums and minimums. So it can be an endpoint. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to verify this by having the calculator or the computer graph it for me. X cubed, what was it, minus 4X squared plus 1. And I'm only on the interval negative 1 to 3. And I graph. And there it is. Yeah, that's good. Do y'all see it? So what are y'all um, going to do for homework this weekend? It's Wednesday, right? Yeah. Yeah. So look, where was our global, our global minimum? Was it eight thirds? Eight thirds is about right here. And if you come down, does that look like we got the right number there? Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's, it does look like the, the lowest point on the whole graph. And the highest point happened where? At zero one right there. Look at that. We were able to pull that. We were able to pull those points. Right? That's, that's pretty good. So what you're going to do for your homework this, uh, this weekend is, of course, finish up the L'Hopital, do the quiz on L'Hopital, and I would encourage you to um, start for one's homework. The first few are visual problems, and I did not do homework solution videos for those because it's very visual. I want to see what happens. Um, and, then, and then there's a section where it says find the critical numbers. That means just figure out where the derivative is zero and does not exist. It doesn't ask you to do anything else. Just practicing setting the derivative equal to zero and practicing um, figuring out where it's undefined. At least try some of the polynomials, the, the clean ones, x cubed minus 4x, things like that. When they start become more complicated, like sine functions and roots and all that, you can skip over that for now. And then there's a section right after that where it asks you to actually do what we did here. Again, I would say look at the polynomials and do those. Wait for the harder ones. We'll, we're going to do that next class. We're going to start coming in here and doing this on some nasty looking stuff. Well, not nasty, just stuff you would never think you could find max and mins of. All right, everyone have a great weekend.